Joining me is Charity Bell, who will be speaking with the coalition on April 27th about her approach to um, mentally challenging situations, uh, which she has titled Relentless Positivity. Welcome, Charity. And kind of tell us what, what exactly does that mean, relentless positivity? So relentless positivity is it's a, a an acknowledgement that positivity doesn't come easily. It doesn't stick. It's actually not something that we're hardwired to have. Um, we're actually hardwired to have a negativity bias. And so in order to actually be positive, we have to regularly reaffirm that positivity. So it slips a little bit and we bring it back up. So it's not that everything is wonderful and everything is great and I'm happy all the time. It's this constant reminder that I can make this decision to interpret things in a different way. Mm -hmm. I can see people with more compassion. I can see myself with more compassion and try and put a more positive spin on the challenges that are going to come through everyday life regardless. Mm -hmm. And um, so how do you spread the word about this? And uh, what are some of the, the guiding principles that, um, that, that you take? So, this has been a part of the way that I've been talking to people and speaking for probably the past 15 years. And it's been really exciting to watch people take it on. Um, Relentless Positivity is a piece around this idea that we have the, the power, the ability to choose how we move through this world. And so many times, especially now, we feel as though we're being acted upon. We don't feel like we have power. We don't feel like we have choice. And the one thing we always have choice about is how we react to what happens around us. Mm -hmm. And so now more than ever, I feel like that is the one piece of power that we've held on to is the ability to choose our responses, choose our reactions. And so just constantly reminding ourselves of that, doing daily activities that give us an opportunity to pull in a little bit of gratitude, to understand ourselves, give us ourselves a little compassion and give other people a little compassion as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important, especially uh, now and then we're coming up upon uh, May, which is Mental Health uh, Awareness Month. And yeah. uh, so your your uh, concept is beginning to, um, to sort of take hold. I know uh, you were... Um, uh, recognized as an everyday hero for some of your work with uh, some of the foster children of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? So I've been a foster parent for 25 years, actually. Um, I um, grew up in and out of the child welfare uh, world myself. My mom really struggled. And then when I turned 24, I decided to, um, I was volunteering at a hospital and there was a little one there who really was very sad and very overwhelmed. So I spent an evening with her and then another evening and I found out that they were looking for a foster home for that child. And so I called DCF and asked how one does that. And of course, by the time I'd been licensed, she had moved on to someplace else. But since then I've had about 165 or so kids come through my home. Um, I am really committed to working with biological family. So um, we do not adopt. We work with biological family to try and get those children home safely, or we work with families that are waiting to adopt to take those children in and provide them with that support, hopefully with those family connections maintained. Wonderful. Great. Well, um, so anything uh, else that you want to talk about with regard to the relentless possibility uh, positivity and what what exactly uh, will you be focusing on on April 27th and why should uh, people come out to attend so people are struggling now I think we're all exhausted this has probably been one of the most challenging times collectively globally to be a human um, there is no part of our lives that feels like things are as they were, that they're going comfortably, that we feel like we can see the future financially, um, socioeconomically, politically, uh, health wise, like you pick it and it feels kind of shaky. Mm -hmm. And when it's hard to be a human, we need to go back to those basic things about the way we care for ourselves and the way we care for those around us. I'm looking at our young people, especially our teens, and I'm incredibly concerned for the ways in which they judge themselves, the ways in which they compare themselves to others, and the ways in which they believe that they need to move through this world with perfection almost. Um, 
we are, so I used to do a speech called Parenting in Unparalleled Times, where I would talk about the fact that um, I am parenting a 13 year old and I am part of the first generation in history to parent children whose lives are utterly unlike our own. So when we look back, I got my very first cell phone about 29 years ago now. And that cell phone was big. It was a brick. And all it did was take calls, sometimes, not very <laughs> often. And so I went from having this brick of a phone at 21 to eventually having a phone that you could text where you remember when we had to press each button three times to get the letter, you might text okay and that's it to something that could maybe, you know, go on the internet to what we have now, which is literally a computer in the palm of your hand plus, and that's now what our seventh, eighth, sixth, fifth graders are getting immediately. Mm -hmm. So the technology gap, the ways in which people interact, you know, we've been very excited about the lowering of the teen pregnancy rate in the U.S. And people look at that as a very good indicator. It's great. There's less teen pregnancy. I have to say, I think there's less teen pregnancy because teens are interacting in person less than they ever have before. If they could figure out how to get pregnant over the Internet, we might see a different number. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things we really have to be aware of is that the ways in which we used to do things, the ways in which we used to parent, the ways in which we used to care for ourselves don't work anymore because we're in a different time. Sure. So the time has come for us to really take measure again, to stop and say, how do I want to move through this? Especially for those of us who are still waiting for things to get back to normal. You know, I don't know if you remember, but this time three years ago, we were doing two weeks to flatten the curve. Right. <laughs> Do you remember two weeks to flatten the curve? Two weeks to flatten the curve. <laughs> so this time three months. years ago, we were doing two weeks to flatten the curve. And we thought that if we could just stay home for two weeks, we could go back to normal. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking to recognize that we will never go back to that place. Right. Um, there are things, you know, there's things that we've gained, but there's many more things that we've lost. Mm -hmm. And I think that now we need to make decisions about how we're going to care for ourselves. I talk about brain health, not mental health. We don't have a mental, um, but we have a brain and a brain is just a piece of our body that we can care for. Mm -hmm. So you have lungs and you have a heart and you have ankles and you have knees and you have all these parts of your body that sometimes do really well and sometimes struggle, our brain is the same. And so if our brain is struggling, there are things that we can do to increase our flexibility, to increase our strength in our brain, just like there is in any other part of our body. And that's what we'd be talking about. Great. And I think it's so important uh, now, especially over the last three years uh, since uh, COVID began, um, is that I, I think there's more of a recognition now of how mental health plays a role in an overall overall health. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be sort of mental issues were kind of separate from, you know, your heart issues and your lung issues, but it, it actually plays a role because, you know, numbers bear out that people who are less stressed and who handle um, situations uh, mentally are, are, are healthier, you know, as far as blood pressure, strokes, things of that nature. We know that brain health is health, um, that our entire body relies upon the chemicals and hormones that are released by our gut and by our brain. And we actually learn more every day mm -hmm. about how important those are to our overall sense of well-being. Absolutely. And so if people want to uh, learn a little bit more before uh, they come to your seminar on April the 27th, uh, how can they um, how can they get in contact with uh, your organization? They can definitely go to my website, um, which is relentlesspositivity.com. Is it .com or .org? I think yours is .org. <laughs> I think it's .org too. Relentlesspositivity.org. Um, and they can email me from there. And I really look forward to seeing folks. Right. In person. Yes. <laughs> and if people feel more comfortable wearing a mask, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, we want people to come in a way that feels comfortable for them. Right. And will there be a, a hybrid option as well to join 
via Zoom or? I do not know. I think that's up to the Stoneham Coalition. Oh, okay, well, we will find that out. And if so, <laughs> we'll add that information. Um, so Perfect. Charity Bell, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. And we can't wait to see you on April 27th at the Stoneham Public Library at 7 p.m. It's a pleasure. I can't wait either. Thank you. Thank you.